Okay. So in general, how do you approach these problems? So I'll, I'll just give you a broad overview of how to go about these problems. Uh, so here are the steps. First thing that you do is you decide on some directions for the currents. So it's, it's fine if they're not, not, not correct. So you just decide on some directions for the cur currents. And I'll show you an example of that in, in just a little bit. Um, if you can figure out what the direction of the current is going to be, if that's obvious to you, then that's fine, use that. But even if it's not obvious to you what the directions of the currents are going to be in, the, in all the different branches, you can just randomly pick them. Uh, the only thing that you need to be careful about is that the currents at each junction must obey the junction rule, which means that whatever currents you decide are going out of a junction must equal the sum of the currents that are going into the junction. So just make sure that at each junction, the junction rule is obeyed. That's the only thing. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you choose the directions of the currents correctly. This next thing that you do is that, um, so, so you're, you've already applied the junction rule to the currents and that's how you make sure that your currents are consistent. The next thing that you do is that you apply the loop rule to various loops, right? And uh, suppose in the question, there are three unknown currents. Uh, one equation connecting the three unknown currents will come from the junction rule. And so you need two more equations for three unknowns. So you're just gonna apply the loop rule twice. So just to pick two loops and apply the loop rule and that will give you two more equations. So ultimately your goal is to get three equations for your three unknowns, if you've got three unknowns. And if you've got two unknowns, then obviously you just need two equations, right? So that's, that's the whole, whole plan here. So let's see how we would do this in practice. Okay, so um, before we do that, let me just clarify one more thing before we actually dive into this problem. Uh, when you are keeping track of all the changes in potential that are happening, uh, there are just a couple of things that you have to keep in mind. So suppose you're going from point A to point B. Maybe I should, I'll just repaste this later on. Suppose you're going from point A to point B while traversing the circuit, and you see that there is a battery in between points A and B, and the battery is connected like this. This is point A and this is point B. Now, will, you, will that count as a drop in potential as you're going from A to B? Or does B have a lower potential than A? Or does B have a higher potential than A? What, what do you think? Is that a, if you go from A to B, is that a drop in potential or is that a rise in potential? Drop. Yes, because you, A is connected to the high potential end of the battery and B is connected to the low potential end of the battery. So clearly B must have a lower potential than A. That makes sense? Similarly, suppose you're going from A to B and you, you encounter a battery that's connected like this. So in this case, will it be a rise or a drop of potential as you go from A to B? In all these diagrams, you're going from left to right, from A to B. So is in the second case, is it a rise or a drop in potential? A rise. Yes, because A is connected to the low potential end of the battery and B is connected to the high potential end of the battery. So that's going to be a rise in potential. All right, uh, an another situation that you might see is that you're going from A to B. There is a resistor over here and the current is flowing in this direction from left to right, okay? Now, current will only flow through a resistor if there is a potential difference between the ends of the resistor. If both ends of the resistor are at the same potential, then there is no reason for current to flow, right? So, and, and also remember that the conventional current always flows from high potential to low potential, right? So keeping all that in mind, if you go from A to B in this third diagram over here, uh, is that a rise or a drop in potential? A drop? Yes, and can you explain why? Uh, how did you conclude that this is a drop? I know the voltage difference between the two ends is IR. I mean, how do you know that A is at a higher potential than B? if it's a drop. So how do you know which one is higher? Because the 
it would not want to move that way if it was yes exactly yeah the current co conventional current always flows from high to low potential very good and similarly suppose you're going from a to b there's a resistor but the current is flowing in the opposite direction so in this case b is at a higher potential than a so in this case it would be a rise in potential and once again hopefully it's clear why b is at a higher potential than a because the conventional current always flows from the high potential side to the low potential side of a battery that makes sense that's all that you need to keep in mind and now we are we are ready to dive into this problem so um i'll have to erase this so i can keep this work with this diagram that i pasted all right so what do we have here? We have two batteries, two resistors. Now, hopefully it should be clear to you that this is not a circuit which you can just reduce to uh, one battery and one equivalent resistance, right? So this is a multi-loop circuit. Uh, you, there is no way of simply combining the resistors to get an equivalent resistance here. Do all of you agree with that? Okay. Um, if you didn't have this middle battery, then you could have combined them, uh, then it would have been a single loop circuit. But with this middle battery, this is not simple at all. Okay, so what the first thing that we need to do is we need to decide on the currents, right? Our goal in this problem is, is to solve all the currents that are flowing through the resistors. And I believe this is R2, uh, this is R1. It didn't show up for some reason. R1 is six ohms, okay. So our goal is to find all the currents which are flowing through all of the resistors, right? So let's try to get, an, get a feel for what the currents must be doing. Now, a current might be coming out of the middle battery or it might be coming out of, uh, yeah. So, and, and there's also a current coming out of the, uh, the battery at the bottom. Uh, I really don't know which way the currents are going. So I'm just gonna guess. So let's just guess that a current I1 comes out of the battery at the bottom like this. And then this current goes through R1. That's why I named it I1. Oops, what happened here? That's <laughs> my hill came back. All right, okay. Hope it doesn't come back again. Um, so, uh, so you have this, um, the current I1 uh, flowing through the resistance R1. Then it gets to this junction. So this junction is, so let's name these junctions. So let's call this A, B, C, D, E, F, maybe. Okay, so then the current I1 gets to the junction C, right? At C, the current is going to branch. So let's say that one branch goes like this, the other branch goes like that. And this branch, let's say, is I3. This current is I3. So this current goes right through the battery and also the resistance R3. And then another branch, which I'm naming I2, goes all the way up to E and then turns right and goes through the resistor R2. And then, oops, uh, then um, it comes back. Uh, so I2 comes back like this, combines with I3 at junction D, and then uh, it re reconstitutes I1 because I3 and I2 make I1 again and I1 goes back into the original battery. So that is the story that I made up regarding the currents. I don't know if that story is true or not, but at least it's consistent because I know that at junction C, my I1, I2, and I3 do obey the junction rule because I1, I'm breaking up I1 into I2 and I3. And then also at junction D, uh, I2 and I3 are combining and I'm naming the combined current again as I1. So the junction rule at least is, uh, is obeyed. That clear to all of you? Though I, I have no idea whether this is the correct direction for the currents or not. Um, a spoiler alert is that you don't, it doesn't matter whether, the, uh, whether your guess regarding the directions is correct because the math will correct you in the end. So that's why it's not super important to get the directions right in the beginning, all right? Okay, so this is my story regarding the currents. Um, I can immediately get a relationship and my goal is to solve for I1, I2 and I3. So these are the three unknowns in the problem, right? So this represents probably one of the most complicated problems that you can have, which has three unknowns. Um, I'll never give you a problem that has more than three unknowns, uh, simply because the method of working would be identical, but just the work would be a lot more tedious. So at most, I'll give you a problem that has three unknowns. Okay, um, all right. 
so these are the three unknowns. So we clearly need three equations. Uh, does the junction rule give us any equation that connects these three unknowns? I1 plus I2 plus I3 plus zero. Uh, we have to be a bit careful with the signs. So, uh, so if you took signs into account, what would that same equation be? I1 minus I2 minus I3 plus zero. Yes, exactly. Very good. So, uh, so the sign that Ethan chose, the sign convention that Ethan chose, is that uh, currents uh, that I one is positive because it's going into the junction, and I two and I three are negative because they're coming out of the junction. So, you have to you have to take the signs into account because a current going into the junction is different from a current coming out of the junction. So, um, the equation that you get is I one is equal to I two plus I three. I like to write it like this. I put the ingoing currents on one side of the equation and the outgoing currents on the other side of the equation and just set them equal. So, uh, but you can do what Ethan did as well, which is the sum of the, all the currents with algebraic signs is equal to zero. The, either, either one is fine. So this equation we get from the junction rule and it's true both for junctions C and D. It's important that when you set up your currents, just make sure that you get the same junction equation for each junction. Um, all right, everybody clear about this? So we found one equation connecting our two unknowns. Our goal right now is to use any method whatsoever to find any two equations, two other equations connecting these three unknowns. And then we are all set. Because with three unknowns, uh, we need all we need is three equations. All right, so we, were, we are gonna use the loop rule to get two more equations. So one possibility is, there are many possibilities, but I'll just take this one. Uh, suppose I, for, I do the loop A, C, D, uh, B, and back to A. So that's the loop that I'm gonna do right now, right? So I'm gonna start at A and I'm gonna go counterclockwise around the lower square and until I come back to A. And I'm gonna keep track of all the changes of potential that are happening along the way. And for that, we'll use the rules that, that I just wrote down a little while ago. Okay, so as I go from A to C, what change of potential? Uh, first of all, is it a drop or a rise as I go from A to C? All right, so I would really appreciate fast responses because so we can get through this faster. So uh, a drop or a rise from A to C? Drop. Very good, thank you. So the amount of drop is going to be um, I1 times six. All of you agree with that. So, so the first entry that we'll make in our logbook is minus six I1 is the drop in potential that we encountered as we went from A to C. That makes sense? Next thing we encounter, we are, we are going from C towards D. First, we see two things along the way. First thing we find is this battery, right? So for that battery, is it gonna be a rise or a drop? Just as I, just as I pass the battery, is it gonna be a rise or a drop? Drop. Yes, and by how much? What's the voltage of the battery? 12. Yes, exactly, minus 12 volts. So, it, the, so I'm going from the high potential to the low potential end of the battery. So it's going to be a drop of uh, 12 volts because the battery has an EMF of 12 volts. Of course, we are assuming all these batteries are identical. Uh, I mean, all these batteries are ideal, not identical. So, um, minus 12, and please keep an eye on my work because I might make a mistake. Okay, so then the next thing that happens is we go through the resistance R3. Um, is that a drop or a rise as I go through the resistance R3? Drop. Yes, by an amount, uh, two times I3, right, IR, so minus two I3. All right, then we get to the point D. Does anything happen between D and B? No, there is no potential drop along a copper wire we, we, uh, we discussed earlier. Uh, and then, uh, then the last leg of our journey is B to A, right? Um, what happens along B to A? What should I put in, the, uh, in, in our logbook? Plus six. Plus or minus? You might have said it already, but uh, plus or minus? Plus. Plus six, very good. 
And that is because we are going from the low potential to the high potential end of the battery. So we see a potential rise of six. And that's it. So we are back to where we started, which means that I can set the sum of all these changes equal to zero, right? And so we have an equation minus six i i1 uh, minus six minus two i3 is equal to zero. If you just want to get rid of these minus signs, multiply this by plus uh, by minus one and you get our second equation. So this is our first equation. This is our second equation. All we need to do is just do any other loop we want and get one more equation and then we are all set, right? So you can do any loop you want, but I think it's probably easiest if we, so you, you always want to pick a loop where it looks like it's not going to be that much work. So you don't want to pick one that's really busy. So uh, we call this point E, right? Okay. So let's do the loop A, E, F, B, A. Uh, that looks like it's a little less work. So as we go from A to E, so what, what happens as we go from A to E, uh, what should I put down? Minus six I one. Very good, minus six I one, because the only thing that I encounter is the resistance R one, and uh, I'm going in the direction of the current. So I'm going from the high potential to the low potential end of the resistor. Uh, so it's minus six i one. Then, then what should I put down next? E from e to f. What what happens? Minus nine i two. Minus nine i two. Very good. And then from f to b, does anything happen? No. So nothing. And then from b to a, uh, same same thing that we saw in the other loop is just going to be uh, plus six, plus six volts. That makes sense. And I found my third equation. And I'm done. That clear to all of you? So now it's just a matter of solving these three equations. Now, in order to solve these equations, uh, you can solve them by hand. I, I'll always give you, uh, this, is, this, is, this represents at most the most difficult problem that I might give you from this, uh, this, this kind of thing. So the equations are, are solvable by hand. Um, uh, but if you want, you can feel free to use a, a solver like Wolfram Alpha. Uh, Wolfram Alpha can solve uh, uh, simultaneous equations. Um, you can also solve them on a calculator using matrices, though I'm not really sure how to do it, though it's very, very simple. You just need to look up a YouTube video. You don't need to know anything about matrices. and It'll just tell you how, which buttons to press in order to solve simultaneous equations. So you can feel free to um, use any calculator to solve them. But as I said, I'll give you equations which are not too hard to solve by hand as well. So it'll just take you a couple of minutes to solve this by hand. Um, if you use Wolfram Alpha, then instead of using I1, I2, and I3 as your variables, make sure to use X, Y, and Z. Otherwise, it won't understand that they're variables. So anyway, so that's, that's how you solve them. Let's say that you go ahead and solve these equations. Uh, I've written down the solution somewhere, and I'll just point something out about the solution, and that's, that's it. Um, The solutions for this, I believe, are right beneath the slide, but I can't see it on my iPad, so I'm opening it up on the computer. Um, let's see, I'm trying to find the slide here. Yeah, so um, if you solve them, what you're going to find is I1 equals minus 0.5 amperes, I2 equals 1 ampere, and I3 equals minus 1.5 amperes. All right, notice that two of the currents came out with negative signs, right? And one of them came out with a correct sign, uh, with a positive sign. What is that telling us? If you ever get a current with a negative sign, the math is telling you that you made the wrong choice for the direction of that particular current. That makes sense? So, so it seems that our guesses for the directions of two of these currents were wrong. Uh, we did get the direction of I2 correct, but I1 and I3, we made a, uh, our, our guess was wrong. So the magnitude is correct. So all you have to do now, if you care about the directions of the currents is to just go back to your diagram and fix the directions of the currents, switch the arrows for the directions of the currents for which you got a negative answer. So that would be our I1. So I1 is actually in this direction. I'm in, indicating a red arrow to indicate the correct, using a red arrow to indicate the correct direction. Uh, I2, we did get it correct, so so this I2 is fine. That's what we had guessed. 
and I3, our direction was wrong. I3 would be in this direction. So the red arrows now indicate the true directions of the currents, right? So what is actually going on with the circuit is that uh, you have this uh, large current of I3, 1.5 amperes, which comes out of the middle battery. Um, and then it branches out into two branches. One of them goes, uh, goes up and the other one goes down. And that's what's actually happening. And if you think about it, that makes more sense because uh, the battery at the bottom is weak. It's, it's a six fold battery. So it gets overpowered by the battery in the middle, which is much stronger. That makes sense. So that is why a current comes out of the battery in the middle and then it goes into two branches and one of the, those branches overpowers the battery at the bottom because it's a much weaker battery. Is that clear to all of you? So, so if you had figured this out in the beginning on your own uh, and made this choice for the directions of the currents, then all of them would have come out positive, but it doesn't matter. So it, it, even if you make the wrong, wrong choice regarding the directions, the math will just correct you in the end. Is that clear? That makes sense to all of you? And so that is really all there is to solving problems using, using Kirchhoff's rules.